what a joy to worship with you before I get to open the word and preach it to you. Now, I'm going to confess to you that the passage I'm preaching today is probably not one that you quote a lot. It's probably not one that you run to for comfort. You might pass over this. Oh, yeah, it's Jesus calling the 12 uh, disciples, the 12 apostles. But I, I'm, I hope that today we can unfold this in such a way that you can see why this is so significant. Remember, I've tried to emphasize to you that it's not just merely what the storyline is, what, what's happening in the narrative, in the story, but it's always what is Luke doing with it. Luke is not merely a historian, he's a theologian. He's got a theological purpose, an agenda, if you will. And he wants us to get the theology. He's teaching us not merely the story of what happened, but why it matters. Remember, he told us in the first four verses of the gospel that this is so that we might know with certainty the things that we've heard about Jesus. He, he wants us to know Jesus with certainty. He wants us to know why Jesus did what he did and who he is and that he is worthy of our trust. And so we come to this passage in the 12th verse of chapter 6 that Luke has already been giving us a lot of activity in the life of Jesus. We've seen especially these Sabbath encounters where he's dared to heal on the Sabbath and he's, he's getting the rage, the fury of the Pharisees because he's not playing by their rules. He's not doing it the way they think it should be done. And it is in these days, Luke says, that he went out to the mountain to pray and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. I have a friend who uh, has been my friend since 1980. Yeah, 1980. Uh, and he used to be in my life a lot, but now I only see him, I only hear from him when he needs something. Uh, I'll go months, even years sometimes between contact with him and, and then he'll call or he'll show up and inevitably... He's got some sad story and he needs help uh, financially or getting something done or a job or whatever. He never calls just to say, how you doing? Man, I appreciate you. He, he never expresses gratitude to me for all the things I've done for him through the many years. And, you know, I'm always happy to help him to the best I can when he calls, but I, I'll just confess to you, I really feel mostly used by him. That's all I seem to him to be is just someone to help him solve problems. I have two sons. My sons sometimes ask things from me. But it, it's funny that when, whenever my sons ask something from me, they always begin by saying, now, if this isn't good for you, it's okay. I, 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 I don't want you to put yourself out. And they, they ask with a humility, with a lack of expectation. There's no demand in it. They're genuinely asking. But most of the time they call me, they're not asking for anything. They're just calling to see how I'm doing. Or sometimes they call and they say, you know, I met somebody today who told me what a blessing you've been in their life. Someone whose life you have shaped and touched. Someone told me some story about you and, and man, it just made me grateful. You're my dad. I just wanted to tell you I love you. Man, I, I like their phone calls. When, they, when I see on my cell phone that it's Michael or Seth calling me, unless there's just some real reason not to answer 
unless I'm with somebody, or I'm, I'm going to take that call. I'm, I love talking to them. That's what prayer should be like. It's not wrong for us to ask the Father for things. But if that's the description of what your prayer life is most of the time, Lord, I'm in trouble. I need you to fix things. Lord, I've got this need. I, I need you to do something for me. And if that's really all your prayer life is, you know, I know the Lord still loves you, but I believe he probably just feels used. And the reality is God saved you to use you, not for you to use him. I, I can't help but see here in this text how Jesus prayed. He He's not just asking God for stuff. He's just not asking God to help him out of a fix. With all that's going on, Jesus takes the time and he, he goes up onto the mountain and he prays all night long. Now, if there's nothing else we should learn from that, it's that Jesus prayed. Jesus, the Son of God, the sinless Messiah, prayed. And if Jesus prayed, I need to pray. You know, that, that's just, isn't that a simple lesson? If Jesus prayed, I need to pray. And the reality is, if you got nothing else out of this sermon and you really got that and you said, yes, that's exactly right. I need to talk to my father. I need to tell him that I love him. I need to express my gratitude and appreciation to him. Sometimes when I ask him for things, I need to tell him, now, Lord, this is not a mark of your faithfulness to me. You've proven that on Calvary's cross and the empty tomb. And so if you don't do this for me, if you don't give me this, if you don't heal me, Lord, I'm okay. I still love and trust you because you're my father and you're a good father. And if Jesus did that, surely you and I should do that. And if you get nothing else out of this sermon, but a determination to pray, to pray more, you know, Prayer shouldn't be something we feel guilty about not doing. It should be something we desire to do, to spend more time. You know, uh, the older I have gotten, the harder it is for me to sleep. Now, this isn't an unusual thing. I think most people of a certain age will tell you sleep is harder when you get older. When I was a teenager, man, I could sleep all night long. We'd get up when we lived in Michigan when I was a teenager. I'd sleep all night long. We'd get up and we'd leave the house 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning to come to Lexington and visit our relatives. I'd go to sleep in the back seat of the car. I'd wake up about the time we got to Georgetown, coming down I-75. Yeah, I, I, and then I'd go to sleep again that night. I don't know what it is about teenagers and sleep, but, man, teenagers can do it. They can just sleep in. They just sleep in until 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I couldn't do that if my life depended on it now. I... I find it harder to sleep, and yet I need sleep more. It's like, man, if I don't get my sleep, the day is hard. You know what I'm saying? It is, it is hard to function when you just don't sleep. You know, it, when it's 2 o'clock in the morning, if I've not gone to sleep, I'm dreading the rest of that day. I'm dreading the way I'm going to feel when I get up at 5.30 in the morning. You know, I own three, three and a half hours left, and I'm not asleep yet, and I've got to get up and got to hit the ground running. I need my sleep, you know, I need sleep. But here's the reality. I need prayer more than I need sleep. Could it be that we are spiritually weak? We are spiritually sleepy, if you will, because of a lack of prayer? Jesus spent all night in prayer. Notice the way Luke introduces it, it was just that little phrase, in these days. Now, what days is this? Well, we've been looking ever since Jesus stepped into that synagogue in Nazareth and read from the Isaiah scroll and he declared his ministry begun. Think about all that's happening in, in these days. Why, he's been the object of hatred. They tried to, they wanted to throw him off the, the brow of the cliff there in Nazareth. He's cast out demons. He's healed many sick people. He's He's made lepers whole and limbs function again. He's preached the gospel. He's performed a miracle. 
He's been hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. And because of this, he has enraged the Pharisees who are now plotting to put an end to him. And it is in these days that Jesus goes up into a mountain to pray all night. The greater the activity around me, man, the more I need to pray. Now, is your life full? Is your life busy? Sometimes you are so busy, you are so full and so scheduled that you must get away and pray. You know, the reality is we think exactly the opposite. My life is so full, I have so much to do today, I don't have time to pray. You've got it exactly backwards. When you're in these days, when you are in these days that are so full, and so occupied and you've got so much to do and so many people who need you and calling out for your attention and such a difficult job to do and a task to perform, that's when you need to get alone and pray. You need prayer even more than you need sleep and I know you need sleep. The greater the activity, the more you need to pray. So Jesus goes to the mountain. Now, again, I want you to notice what Luke does with this word mountain because anytime you see that in Luke, he's got a theological purpose. The mountain, Jesus is always going to the mountain for spiritual activity. He's on the mountain where he's tempted in the wilderness and Satan takes him up. The mountain is a place of both spiritual devotion to God but also spiritual opposition from the devil. It's sort of the realm of the spirit and Jesus goes to the mountain. When he comes down, this is like he's coming down always to be with humanity. He teaches in, in Luke the Sermon on the Mount, not in, on the mountain, it's the Sermon on the Plain. We're going to get there next week. And uh, he comes down to teach people. He's teaching Peter and the others on the seashore. But when he's up on the mountain, this is a time of being alone with God. And so Jesus goes to the mountain. Why does he go? What's he praying for? Well, he's praying, in our terminology, we'd say he's praying to be in sync with the Father. It's not that Jesus needs some great thing done for him. He's not asking God to give him some power he doesn't already have. He is God. But Jesus, as part of the Godhead, he is accustomed to perfect fellowship with God the Father and with God the Holy Spirit. And so in his humanity now, he feels this acutely. In his human flesh, in his limitation, his self-limitation, his weakness of the flesh, he has to spend time with God. He, he's got to be in sync with the Father. He, he loves time with the Father. This is not a chore to him. It is not something that he has to cross off of a list. It's not some commitment he made uh, at a watch night service on New Year's Eve and he's going to do it all year long. This is what he wants to do. He wants to spend time with God. And he'd even rather spend time with God than sleep. And he goes alone to this mountain to pray to be in sync with the Father but he needs to make right decisions. And he's praying before he makes a momentous decision. How often do we make decisions based on every calculation, how much we're gonna make, what the schools are like, uh, how easy things are, whether or not we fit. You know, we make decisions based on everything but the will of God. And Jesus spends time with God. He spends a lot of time with God because he's about to make significant decisions. And it may not be that God's going to just always speak into your heart in such a direct way that you know exactly what the right decision is. But here's what I, I know. The Bible teaches that God wants your, you to do his will even more than you want to do it. And if you will saturate yourself with God's word and with the presence of God, here's the reality. You can't make the wrong decision. God, God will so 
protect you and prevent you. If you are occupying your life with seeking to honor him and to do his will, he's going to make sure that you get to do that. If you are following, well, what is the revealed will of God? The revealed will of God is his moral will. I don't have to pray about whether or not I should be kind to Tanya. I don't have to ask God about that. His word tells me that. I don't have to pray about whether or not to be generous. I don't, I don't have to pray about whether or not to be truthful. These things are the revealed will of God. So if I spend my life seeking to do what God has clearly revealed, when it comes to those things that are not so clearly revealed, then I trust that God will not let me make the, the wrong decision. I, I look at all the data, I look at all the facts, I, I use what I call sanctified common sense. But in the end, when everything looks equally good, and I say, Lord, I don't know exactly what is best here, I'm just going to make a decision and I'm going to trust that you guide me. You know what? God has always been faithful. And every time I've had to do that, it has always and without fail turned out to be exactly the right decision. Now, if you're living in your flesh and you're seeking to satisfy yourself and you're doing things based on your own desires and you're not seeking the Lord, guess what? You're on your own. You want to be on your own? God will let you be on your own. But Jesus knew he did not want to be on his own. He had to seek the will of the Father to make the right decisions and to see truth clearly and objectively. Don't take for granted that you see things correctly. It's easy. We live in a world that is always trying to tell us that truth is relative. Man, if I hear one more person say, well, I've got to speak my truth. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, guess what? You don't get your own truth. There's one truth. There's an objective reality out there. There's not my truth and your truth, and we're all, you know, got to honor and respect each other's truth. No, we respect God's truth. But the world, see, see how subtle the world is? They like that word truth. They just don't like what it means. They're using God's words, but their own dictionary. And you've got to be able to see truth objectively, not subjectively, clearly, not through the cloud, the fog, uh, and the mist of the world, the age in which we, we live. You see, the influence of the world is erosive and insidious. The world will convince you that there are multiple truths and there are multiple ways to heaven and that Jesus is, you know, it's, it's all right. The world would be fine with you honoring Jesus as a religious teacher and a helper of humanity and all those wonderful good things. But the minute you say Jesus is the only way of salvation, okay, then the world says, no, 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 that's not my truth. You're entitled to your truth. You know, uh, every time I go to Israel, uh, most of the time, we have Jewish guides and they'll talk to us and they'll say, and in, inevitably, the, this, the discussion will come up, is Jesus the Messiah or not? And they'll say, well, I believe he's your Messiah. Uh, and, you know, we, I believe that he's, he's your Messiah. Well, you know, we don't all get our own individual Messiahs. There's a Messiah. Either Jesus is Lord or he's a lunatic, but he's not my personal individual Messiah and you can have somebody else. See, but the world, the, the world tries to erode our confidence in that. You need to ask him to make you care more about his will than the world's opinion. Man, I pray for our students here at Buck Run. I realize that the world that they're in, in the classroom, both in in public school and in college, they're just daily going to be battered with an assault on biblical truth and, and reality. Man, we need to pray for them. We need to lift them up. We need to encourage them to stay faithful to the truth that God has revealed in his word, that they might care more about his will than the world's opinion. 
Jesus has something pressing on his heart. What would be pressing on the heart of Jesus so heavily that he would feel the need to go up the mountain and spend all night in prayer? He's about to choose the 12. He's about to choose those whom we call the apostles. He's about to choose the new tribes of Israel. Now, this means that there are great possibilities out there. This is going to influence, Jesus knows, the future of his church. And the greater the possibilities, the more I need to pray. So Jesus here is facing a decision that's going to affect a lot of things. And he needs to be in sync with the Father. He needs to make right decisions. He needs to see truth clearly and objectively. So he prays because Jesus had many disciples, but he chose 12 apostles. Now notice Luke uses that word. Did you catch that? Uh, that's, the, that's the only, uh, Luke is the only one of the evangelists who used that word uh, in the Gospels. Uh, Mark, I think, uses the verb that Jesus sends them, apostello, but uh, Luke is the only one who uses apostolos, the, the noun form. He calls them apostles. And this is the first time that that word appears in the New Testament. It's the only time I think it appears in the Gospels. But it's going to be very important that you catch when Brother Chris read the scripture from Ephesians 2 that he, he read about the foundation of the church being built on the apostles and the prophets. You see how key these are? So Luke wants to nail this down. He wants us to see that, the, that this anchors the identity, the authority, and even the theology of the 12 securely in the life and the ministry of Jesus. Now, why is this important? Because in the future, remember like in 2 Corinthians, when Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and he, he's putting his hands up on his head and he's going, I, I, I can't believe you guys have been led astray. And he talks about these guys, Paul mockingly calls them super apostles. He says, I, I think I'm better than these super apostles. What's happened? You've got others that are claiming to be apostles. Others that are claiming to represent the Lord's church. And so Luke, who writes his gospel, remember Luke is a companion of Paul's on his missionary journeys, and Luke knows that there are others out there claiming to be apostles and others that are claiming to have the truth. Luke wants Theophilus, the beloved of God, and you and me to know that these guys are the ones that Jesus named as the apostles. Don't be led astray by the others who pop up and say, I'm an apostle too. Now, this is significant. You can drive down the road today and you'll see churches all over the place that say apostolic church. And you can just know right now, that's not true. Uh, there are denominations that claim that they have apostles. One time I was talking to a pastor in Lexington who, who uh, was in a church that he claimed that they were apostolic. And so I just asked him point blank. I said, so are you an apostle? And he said, well, I don't know. You know, some, some say I am, I don't know. Maybe I, I shouldn't say that. I could see he was struggling with this whole issue of whether or not he was an apostle. And I said, well, let me just nail this down for you. You're not. <laughs> and here's the evidence. Jesus chose how many? 12. And he called them what? Apostles. Now, this is it. These are the 12. Jesus called them apostles, and so that nails it down. There is an implicit criticism here in this list of any Christian movement that bases itself on others who call themselves apostles. Now, up to this point, Luke's interest is lay solely in Jesus, in the ministry of Jesus. But here, he's notice there's a subtle shift that's going to take place. Now he's going to be showing us how Jesus transmits this truth and authority to them. He's going to teach them. He's going to send them out. 
And then, of course, Luke also writes the book of Acts. Luke and Acts are like two volumes of the same work. And in the Acts volume, he's going to show how these apostles then carry out the work of Jesus and how the, the truth is propagated and how the church grows and goes around the world through the ministry of these 12 whom Jesus chooses. So Jesus had to seek the will of the Father because these, these 12 nobodies are going to be part of the foundation of his church, the new Israel. And so, you know, Jesus isn't choosing between good and bad here. He's got many disciples, but he's choosing 12 to be apostles, and he has to choose specifically the ones that God wants him to choose because his choice is not between good and bad. It's between like our choices are usually between good and best. This is why we need God. This is why we need prayer. It's easy to choose between good and bad. I know, don't do the bad. Don't choose the bad. That's easy. But the choice for us, the struggle is usually between good and best. How can I maximize God's work in my life? How can I be most effective in being a Christian and sharing the gospel and using my money and investing my time? What is the maximum I can do? And I don't have to choose between Satan worship and worshiping Jesus. That's, that's no choice. That's easy. The, the choice is, all right, am I, am I better as a pastor or a missionary? Am I I'm better as a, a a person working out in the workforce, sharing the gospel there, or going to seminary and going into the ministry. I mean, these are the kinds of things Christians think about and wrestle with. What is the best that I can do? And this is why I need the Father's will. Because the greater the consequences, the more I need to pray. And much is at stake in Jesus' choice of these 12. What's Jesus calling them to do? Well, he's calling them to follow him, right? Now, we've already seen Luke has given us a glimpse of the way he chooses them individually to come be his disciples. Remember the scene there in the previous chapter where Jesus is uh, teaching in Peter's boat and he tells him to cast his net out, launch out into the deep and throw your net out there. And remember the net caught so many fish that it began to break and and, and the ships begin to sink and, and Peter says, depart from me, Lord, I'm, I'm a great sinner. And Jesus says, no, you come follow me. He called Peter, he called James and John right then. So they're already his disciples, but now he's going to call them to follow him even more closely. And th I think this is the way Jesus often works. He calls us in salvation. What a what a wonderful call this is. I, I can remember as a boy, I, for a whole year, I felt the burden of my sin, the conviction of being lost. And then when I put my faith and trust in Christ, when I remember that Sunday night in March of 1967, it was like, man, I've got to do this. And I felt him call me. But then later, just three years later, I'm 10 years old, I feel him call me into ministry. That was reaffirmed when I was 19 and a freshman at Michigan State University. And I felt God just call me into his service. I, I, I didn't really feel called to preach at the time. It was like, well, I was even trying to go back on what I knew when I was 10 years old. And I said, well, I, I'll be in ministry, but I don't think it's a pulpit ministry. And I was in music. And, and when I'm 20, I end up being the minister of music and youth at Ashland Avenue. But in the course of the years there, before long, and that desire to preach and teach, it just grows greater and greater. And what's God doing? He continues to refine that call and call me specifically. Really, it's ultimately a call to follow him. And if you say yes to following Jesus, then it doesn't matter where he leads you, you're going to go. If he calls you to be a missionary, if he calls you to be a pastor, if he calls you to be a, a Bible teacher in some way, whatever he's calling you to do, you'll do if you've just said yes to following him. So Jesus calls these 12 to follow him more closely. And even within the 12, they're going to be those intimates of Peter, James, and John. 
Jesus, you know, he doesn't have favorites, but he does have intimates. And he calls them to be even more intimate with him. He's calling them to learn. Now, the word disciple means learner. That's, that's its most literal meaning. And notice that God, God chooses nobodies. Did you see the list? Let's just look at the list. Let's read these names again so that you, you get a little appreciation of it because most, most of them you don't ever really even hear about. We know <clears throat> certainly Simon Peter, Andrew his brother. John tells us a little bit more about Andrew. James and John, they show up a lot. We know from Matthew and Mark that Jesus also calls them, I think rather mockingly, Boanerges, sons of thunder. I mean, these are the guys whose mama comes and asks Jesus if they can sit by him in the kingdom. Yeah, the real thunder sons there, man. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so we know a little bit about them. Philip, uh, we know a little about Philip. Bartholomew, you don't know a thing about Bartholomew. Bartholomew didn't, didn't, as far as we know, he didn't write Hebrews. So he didn't write anything. Matthew, we know his gospel. He's also, Luke calls him Levi earlier. We have the, the, the calling of Levi. Thomas, what do we know about Thomas? Poor guy. He, the, the name he gets for just one question. Uh, that, that's what we know about Doubting Thomas, you know, the, you know, the Christian tradition says Thomas dies in India. He, he, he's martyred in India. He takes the gospel as far as India and there he's martyred at a place today that bears his name called Martoma. Uh, again, that's not certain, but that's been Christian tradition for a long, long time. And we think that's what happened to him. So Thomas might've had doubt at one time, but, but it looks like he was very, very faithful to the end. James, the son of Alphaeus. So this is not James, the, uh, the brother of John. This is it James uh, bar Alphaeus? And Simon the Zealot. Now, the Zealots are, these guys are insurrectionists. They want to fight war. They, wanna, they want to fight against Rome. And so you've got, on the one hand, you've got Matthew or Levi, who is a tax collector, who is a collude, he's in collusion with, with Rome. And then you got Simon, the zealot, who wants to fight Rome. These guys would have naturally hated each other. And Jesus chooses both of them to be his apostles. That says something about the nature of the church, doesn't it? Man, any time we get split over issues of the world and politics inside the church of the Lord Jesus Christ where we're missing our calling because Jesus has called us to something that transcends nations and politics and movements. Jesus has called us to be followers of his and Judas, the son of James. So there are two guys named James and then two guys named Judas, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Now, Jesus is, he, these guys are nobodies. They're, they're, they're mostly from Galilee. Several of them are fishermen. These guys are country bumpkins. They're not, they didn't sit at the feet of Gamaliel. They aren't Pharisees. They aren't particularly religious guys. They're, they're guys from every walk of life, and God, Jesus chooses them. Oswald Chambers wrote, God can achieve his purpose either through the absence of human power and resources or the abandonment of reliance on them. All through history, God has chosen and used nobodies because their unusual dependence on him made possible the unique display of of his power and grace. He chose and used some bodies only when they renounced dependence on their natural abilities and resources. You ever look at somebody that's unusually gifted, but they're not a believer, and you find yourself thinking, man, if Jesus would save that guy, they could really, that, that guy could really add something 
Do you ever find yourself thinking that way? You realize what's wrong with that way of thinking? You think God needs their talents and their gifts? No, God doesn't need anything you and I have. He, he just wants us to follow him. We're nobodies. Paul talked about this. Look around you, man. We're, we're, there aren't many wise. There aren't many mighty. There aren't, aren't many noble that God has called. But he's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And he uses us to speak truth in a world that is committed to their own blindness. They're not going to pat us on the back. They're not going to applaud us. They're, they're going to often uh, accuse us and misrepresent what we say and ultimately hate us. This is why Jesus is calling these guys. He's calling them to follow and to learn from him what really is true. He's calling them to lead. These are going to become the ones that lead this movement throughout the world because the gospel is for the world and the only way the world's going to get the gospel is that these guys have to go. They have to train others. They have to be followers of Jesus and then they have to be examples to others who follow them who then are examples to others who follow them and on and on all the way down to the Buck Run Baptist Church following this apostolic truth. This is why Jesus calls them. But there's something else. I believe that that night as Jesus spends time in prayer, the part of what weighs so heavily on his, on his heart is that Jesus knows that ultimately he's calling these men to die. He's not saying, hey, Peter, come follow me and I'm gonna, you're going to find fabulous wealth. I'm going to bless your seed faith offering and you're going to have a private jet and you're going to get your own mansion and a lake house because, man, I'm going to show the world that when you follow me, you get all this great stuff. He's saying, Peter, you come follow me and eventually you're going to end up in Rome where they're going to crucify you upside down. And James, I want you to come follow me and you know, uh, Herod's going to kill you and we're barely going to mention it in the book of Acts. You're just going to get one little line just so everybody knows you're out of the story. That's all you get. Come follow me. That's the glory that awaits you. Jesus knows what it's going to mean that they follow him. He's calling them to die. Whether you know it or not, whether you admit it or not, when he called you, that's what he called you to do. And he's very honest about this. I'm, I'm always a little stunned that people... Act like they don't know this because Jesus didn't say, take up your cushion and follow me. He said, take up your cross. To follow him is a life of crucifixion. Jesus said that here's what they have done to me. And if they do it to the master, they're going to do it to the servant. Don't think you're going to escape this. He's been very candid, very honest. You are called to follow Jesus even unto death. So why do we keep thinking that we can have a Christian life that is somehow comfortable and safe? It's not safe. Not in this world. It wasn't safe for the apostles when Jesus called them. And, and that's exactly the point. The greater the challenge, the more I need to pray. Jesus knows the challenge that lies before these men. And so he prays all night. He's calling those who will be foundational to the church. This, uh, the, the word, he, he chose 12. What a great word. This is sovereign election. None of the 12 applied for the position or sought the appointment. They were divinely chosen. In fact, that will be a great comfort to them in the tumultuous years that follow. They're going to be able to comfort themselves that Jesus chose me for this. I mean, if you did it because 
this was your career choice, there'd kind of come a point when you're looking at a Roman cross, you go, this was not a good decision. This was not a good thing I'm doing here. But if you know Jesus called you, Jesus chose you, Jesus has appointed you to this, then when you face it, you can say, this is why I'm here. This is my purpose. I can do this by the grace of God. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. We sang it. Do you believe it? Do you, do you live it? Jesus, not them, was responsible for the choice. Now notice, did you notice the number? <laughs> the number 12 matches that of the tribes of Israel. They're sent out as the Messiah's official emissaries to the nation. And as such, they're going to have special power and authority. After Pentecost, they're going to have be imbued with power and they're going to become the official witnesses and leaders of the new community of the church. And some of them are going to be the inspired writers of the New Testament. And Chris read to us from Ephesians 2, there in that beautiful passage where they, along with the prophets, are the, the foundation of the church. Well, think about this. Abraham looked for these apostles. How do I know that? Listen to this. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. Again, Abraham didn't apply for that job. God called him. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place when he would, which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Okay, what city is that? All right, turn with me. We'll go over to Revelation chapter 21. I want to read a lengthy passage because, man, it's, it's a good one. Let's just read it. Here's the description of the new Jerusalem. What city was Abraham looking for? What land did God promise Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? Because they died without getting it, right? That's what Hebrews 13, 11, 13 says. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having greeted them from afar. They saw this is coming. Well, what city is, that, is it that Abraham's looking for? Listen to this. Verse 9 of Revelation 21. Then, I saw, uh, then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I'll show you the, the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain. Imagine that. And showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like, like a jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and at the gates, 12 angels and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed on the east three gates and on the north three gates and on the south three gates and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length, the same as its width. And he measured the city with the rod, 12,000 stadia, its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each of 
the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They'll bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever in it enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Man. I want you to see this, that when Jesus prays on the mountain, he is seeing these 12 nobodies, but he's looking into the new Jerusalem and he's saying these are going to be the foundation of the new Jerusalem. And my whole church is going to be built on this. I'm going to raise up a people from these that I am going to pay for with my own blood. And man, Jesus calls those 12 and I want you to know that he is every bit as specific in calling you. You, you are not just some vague person generations later to the Lord Jesus. He called them just like he died for you. You're on his heart. He prays for you. What's he still doing? This is the one work of Jesus that continues. He's at the right hand of the Father and he's ever what? Interceding. The same as he did on that mountain. Now he does at the right hand of the Father. He's praying for you. He's asking God to give you strength. He's asking God to, to give you the wisdom, the knowledge to do his will. But remember, one of these 12 is going to be replaced. One of the 12 that Jesus calls is not really his. Jesus is calling one who is a traitor because even he has a purpose in the plan and the sovereign work of God. But when Jesus calls him, Jesus knows what he's going to do. Jesus calls him because Judas is going to set into action the very thing that is going to result in the lamb being sacrificed. So when Jesus is praying, he's praying to receive power to endure as well as to choose. No doubt he's praying for those whom he chooses, but he's praying that he might be faithful to the will of the Father, even in this. Now, here's what I lay before you. Do you see the length to which Jesus went to accomplish our salvation? Do you see the care with which he did it, the prayer that went into it, the love? And today, that same Christ speaks to your heart and he's calling you to follow. He's calling you to follow more closely and to grow ever nearer to his heart and deeper in his will and to learn and maybe yes, even to die for him. But the greatest joy you'll ever know is following Jesus because these guys by the shore of Galilee might look like nobodies, but man, in the New Jerusalem, they're not. You might be a nobody here, but in the New Jerusalem, you won't be. And he who speaks your name here on earth and calls you to salvation and calls you to discipleship will speak your name when you stand before the Father and he'll say, she's mine. He's mine. This is the grand, the grand sweep of God's work and Jesus' redemption. And the question for you today is, 
with the will of God. I know we spend a lot of time saying, oh, I want to know the will of God. I want to know the will of God. But you know the reality is most of us in the broadest terms know the will of God. I think you know what it is God is requiring of you right now. So I don't pray to know the will of God nearly as much as to do the will of God.